Hello, this is Tim Baldridge, and uh, today we're going to start a series of tutorials on concurrency and closure. Now, we've done a lot of tutorials about core async at this point, close to 20 of them actually, and um, yet we haven't covered some of the more basic forms of concurrency control and closure, some of the uh, simplest, perhaps, most commonly used. So we're going to talk about atoms, refs, and agents, so we're going to start with atoms today. Now, atoms are, are kind of interesting because in Java they require a creation of an object um, uh, called an atomic reference uh, in uh, Java that's wrapped in closure um, as an atom. But uh, at the lowest level, if you were doing perhaps assembly code or even uh, C++, um, it takes, it, it's just any old pointer is what it is, a pointer to some data. Now, how you manipulate that pointer um, is often with these uh, these other instructions that we'll cover today, um, specialized computer instructions. So in closure though, we'll start off with creating an atom and we'll give it a value of one. So if we create that, we can deref it to get the value. And this is instantaneous, it's just reading the value and it's one, right? Now let's, uh, let's create uh, a problem here. Let's create a race condition. Let's say we have a bunch of threads. We're going to ha have a bunch of futures here. Um, and these futures actually we'll do for um, something in range of 100. We're going to create 100 threads. And each one of those is going to be created with a future like this. And then we're going to go do times um, to 10,000 or sorry, 1,000, and for each one of those times, we're just going to reset the value of the atom. Um, we're going to reset A to be the increment of the deref of A, right? So if we, if we go here to reset, we can reset A to 2. And that works. That just goes in and writes a value. And we can deref it. Boom, there we go. Now, the problem is, if you're familiar at all with race conditions, is this little bit right here. The space in time between derefing something and writing a, a value back. Reading and writing the value with the same um, at the same time doesn't really happen um, in uh, programming, right? Uh, it, it's really hard to read a value and write it at the same time. There's some specialized instructions for that, but Let's, most of the time, we're going to read it, do something to value, and write it back. And in that space of time, when we're incrementing the integer right here, another thread could come through and modify it. Now we would say, hey, yeah, what's the likeliness of that happening, right? Well, let's see how likely it is of, ha is of happening. So these are our futures. And then we're going to do seek fs, f of fs, and we're just going to deref the F here, um, and all that does is basically say, hey, don't don't continue on executing, um, and uh, don't return from executing this until everything is done, right? So we're going to reset this atom. We're going to actually reset it to zero this time. So we create our atom, and then we're going to run this. Now, what is the value of A? Should be what, hundred thousand? Well, in fact, it's actually forty-three thousand. We're off by quite a bit quite a bit. And this is the problem with that whole idea of um, unconstrained just walking in and just overriding the value, is that the other threads are overriding each other, and you're missing increments, right? So a common way to deal with this is what's called compare and set, or um, compare and swap, uh, it has different names, uh, often known as CAS, C-A-S, just like this. In closure, it's compare and set exclamation mark. You give it an atom, an old value, and a new value. Now, let's let's just put that in here. Compare and set a, and we'll make uh, a value is uh, the deref of a, and then we're going to set v and inc of v. So this would say only set a. Uh, oh, sorry, only set A to the increment of V if V is what we think it is, right? Right, so if no one's changed it out behind us, then we're good to go. So let's run that. Um, here, how about we try this again? Let's run that. And what is our, our result? 
Well, that didn't do anything really at all. If we run it again, actually, if we reset and run it again, and deref, well, yeah, it's actually a little bit worse. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is, is that what do we do if it fails? If someone has overwritten, well, what we really need to do is we kind of need to, to try again, right? So what we're going to do instead is do a loop. That looks like this. We're going to deref it. We're going to set it. And compare and set returns true or false. True if it worked, false if it didn't. So if uh, not, or we'll just do when not compare and set, then what we're going to do is go here to the end and recur. And we're just going to do this over and over and over again until it works. So let's see if that works. Let's reset our atom. Let's run it. And let's deref it. What do you know? It works just fine. So what, as you see here, there's this loop that's running around and around and around. And now you would think, could this perhaps deadlock? Could there be a situation where one thread is 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 uh, causing the other thread to bail, and they just they cause each other to bail both? Both the times. Well, no, because the only way one thread will have to restart is if another thread has made an update. So this is a a um, uh, topic known as uh, if you remember the correct phrase here. Um, it, it's it's a question of whether or not work can continue. Right? Is there progress being made by some thread in this system? Are one of these 100 threads always making progress? And the answer is yes. Now, some of these threads may be restarting a lot to get, you know, to uh, to have to get to where they're at. In fact, we could probably uh, simulate that here by, um, you know, we'll print, print a little dot here every time something restarts. And we'll take this down to like 10 uh, just to kind of see if, um, you know, so we don't, we don't get a ton of output here. And we'll run this. And we'll see, yeah, there's just quite a lot of restarts, right? But progress is always being made by the system. Now, that's good. So this little loop right here is a pretty common pattern. It's so common, in fact, that Clojure wraps it up for you real nicely in this thing called swap. And the signature for swap is swap. You give it an atom, you give it a function, and then you give it arguments. So we could just as easily, let's turn this to 1,000. We can just take this out, swap ink, um, swap a ink is all we need right here. And it works just as well. And if we run this, ah, oh, oh, sorry, do this again here. There we go. And if we deref it, there we go, 100,000. So that works as we would expect as well, right? Great. We're good. Now, what's interesting about atoms, it's like I said, they're based on this really low-level idea of CAS, and CAS is pretty uh, integral to a lot of computer programming concepts. They're used all the time in uh, concurrent hash tables, um, but also it's kind of interesting that people say, you know, why would I use CAS when I have locks? I've heard, I've heard some people from other languages say, you know, Java or C Sharp, you know, I have a lock, why would, why would I need something like CAS? Why even implement CAS? It makes no sense. Well, the funny thing is, is that locks don't even actually exist at a hardware level. In most hardware, x86, they don't exist, right? What you have instead is CAS. CAS is the basic primitive upon which all other concurrency semantics are built, right? They may use some other features as well, but CAS is the most basic one. Because actually what CAS is, at, at, a, at a really low level, is that it will actually create a lock in, instant, uh, in, in a way, um, uh, amongst the cores in the um, in the CPU. So so basically, one core says, "I'm going to write this location of memory. No one else can touch it till I'm done." And it goes out and it it basically locks that little cache line, makes its modifications, and then when it's done, it says, "Okay, now everybody else can read it." Now it, that means it is a little bit slow. There is some compared to just doing a write, it is slower. But sometimes you need to pay that performance cost in order to um, get the concurrency support you need. So let's let's do something a little bit cool. How would we write a lock using this? Well, it's it's, it's really as simple as this. We're going to create an atom, and it's going to call. It's going to be called uh, 
lock and the value is false, right? Okay, so now we have lock. Now what we're gonna do, uh, actually, you know what? We'll, we'll call this L because I wanna name the function lock. So def n lock and L is our lock. And then what we're gonna do is just do this loop. And then we're going to say, uh, if not, compare and set false true, recur. And then unlock is the other way too. And we could do this uh, in, in several different ways, um, but just for the sake of, of making it um, uh, a bit uh, symmetrical, we're going to do true and false. This would actually cause a problem if you use unlock in the wrong case, so perhaps you want to change this to reset, um, but it'll work for us for now. Okay, so now we can just say lock L, uh, and oh, we need L here. Should have been looking at my uh, tools here to, to show that that's what was wrong. So we got this and we got this. Lock L, boom. And if we look at the value, if we deref L, we'll see that it's true. So, so what's happening here? Let's go ahead and uh, unlock L. All right, so what's happening here? Well, we see we have this atom that starts off as false. It is not locked. There is no lock anywhere in the system. Now, someone's going to come in and say, lock. And the first thread comes along, and it says, if it's false, set it to true. So no one else has locked this yet. So that succeeds. That returns true, and we just exit, exit this, uh, this lock function. Now, while it's locked at this point, so let, let's say here, at this point here, we are in a... Um, a locked state. So if we were to deref the lock, we would see, yes, it is currently locked. Now the next thread comes along and it's going to go in here and say, if it's false, set it to true. Well, it's not false. So it'll recur. If it's false, set it to true. It's not false. And it will just spin. And we can, we can demonstrate that in here. future, we're going to lock L again, and then print line, done. Right? So we run this, it's pending, and it's not until we call unlock here that it prints out done. Right? Now, what's the problem with this? <laughs> it's, it's a busy loop, right? This returns almost instantaneously. No, it wasn't false, so I didn't update it. I didn't update it. I didn't update it. And it just spins. This is what's called a spin lock, funny enough. Um, it, it is used in some situations. Actually, Core Async uh, uses some spin locks internally, at least at this time it does. There, we may use others later. Um, the kind of the kind of good thing about spin locks are is that you don't have to talk to the operating system. Uh, compare and set is not a call to the operating system, like a system call that's actually pretty expensive. Uh, compare and set is a single CPU instruction on x86. It's really fast, um, and it, it works. Um, it, it's quite quick. So if, if you anticipate locking something very rarely, right, or, or, or locking, uh, you're going to keep it locked for a very rare amount of time, or you don't anticipate there being a lot of, of times when multiple threads are trying to lock something, um, then um, a spin lock uh, may work. Or also in the case where um, you just... Uh, um, you don't want to spend that time talking to the operating system. So in Core Async, there are some spin locks on channels, um, mostly because uh, what is involved in in that code inside the lock is basically just going in, appending an item onto a list or a couple of lists, maybe looking in another list, and then getting out and unlocking the channel. That operation is so fast, uh, it's actually faster to just sit there spinning, waiting for the other thread to get out than it is to uh, wait for the operating system to tell you, okay, we're gonna we're gonna wake up. So there you go. Uh, that's CAS. You'll you can read a lot about CAS and how it works, um, uh, but a lot of primitives are built off of it, and you can do a lot of a lot of great things with it. And that's what underlies an atom. An atom is basically just an object upon which you can call CAS and upon which this uh, um, uh, swap function works. Uh, real quickly, let's write our own swap.
And uh, well, this will just be an exercise um, just to sh show us kind of how it works. So A, F, and arcs, right? That's that's the, the signature. And so this is just a loop, just like we did before, right? We're going to deref old val, deref A. And then what we're going to do is we are just going to um, make a new val, which is a, the application of F, old val, and args, right? So we're, we're going to pass in old val as the first argument, args is the rest of the data uh, that was passed in here, the rest of the arguments. And now we have our new val. And then we'll just do if not compare error and set um, the atom with the old val and new val, then we recur. Boom. That's pretty much the extent of swap. Um, let's that's, that's, uh, fix my typo here. That's pretty much the extent of swap, right? So now we can do swap two here. We can redefine our atom. We can deref to make sure it's zero. We run swap two. And then we deref again, and 100,000. Boom. There's a little more logic in closure which we will, um, for atoms, which we will talk about next time, namely validators and watches. Uh, but that's the gist of it right there, is this whole um, uh, applying a function inside the loop. So swap is an abstraction of the common compare and set loop. Compare and set is the low-level operation. That's the tutorial for today. Thank you so much for watching.